Now, can I just get a physical thumbs up? You can all see my first slide towards a cyborg pedagogy. Lovely. Okay, good. So, um, I work with uh, Jess at the AIM here in Barcelona, and I've also got a website, betterlanguagelearning.com. So, to begin, um, this probably the easiest way to do these polls throughout the presentation is with your phone using the QR code um, if you've got uh, the software built in on your phone, or you can use the address slido.com and the code P072. It's not an O, it's a zero. So you've got, I've got three quick questions to find out about your profile, who you are. Okay, so, so far. Okay, so mostly people in Spain, a couple in the EU, elsewhere. Okay, mostly university. And adults, other, okay, uh, some secondary, okay. And, okay, so, okay, so we've got a lot of enthusiastic uh, people. Uh, okay, I guess the skeptics saw what, got one look at our program and said, I'm not coming. Okay, so, okay, so, and then we've got some people, maybe some still obviously, uh, None of us feel entirely comfortable. So here's a video. I want you to guess, we're gonna watch and then you discuss read me the help? video. Do you read me, Hal? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative day, I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. So, do you know which film is this scene taken from? <laughs> no idea. Yes, 2001 Space Odyssey, good, yes. Hal, yes, Hal is the, yes, that creepy computer with the red eye. Yes, okay, good. Now, how would you describe the relationship between Hal and the astronaut? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I love this. Yes. Very emotive language. I like this. Yes. Okay. Yes. So boss in demanding. Yes. Mistrust. Who's the boss? Well, I don't think there's any question who's the boss. It's not, it's not the human being. Okay. So uh, lovely. Okay. Now, um, in a recent talk, I heard someone speaking about artificial intelligence, and I was thinking, what about, we seem to be talking a lot about uh, artificial intelligence, but what about human intelligence? And what is our relationship? What's the relationship between our use of technology and human intelligence? 
And this is where I came up with the idea of a cyborg pedagogy. Now, if you've heard, maybe you're not familiar with the term, if you have heard uh, uh, of uh, cyborgs, what, what sorts of images, what sorts of connotations come to mind? Mm -hmm. Star Trek, science fiction. Enhanced robot, half human, half machine. Doctor Who, yes, memories of childhood, watching the television. Okay, lovely, okay. So, okay. It seems very neutral though. Yeah, okay. Um, Terminator, okay, yes, Terminator. Yes, it's come to destroy humanity. Okay, yes, so um, there's also sort of, again, this, this thread of something a bit undermining, a bit creepy, a bit dangerous. So is this us? Is this our future? And here is a definition of a cyborg taken from Wikipedia. A cyborg, a portmanteau of cybernetic organism is a being with both organic and biomechatronic body parts. It applies to an organism that has enhanced abilities due to the integration of technology that relies on feedback. Now, my question to you is, are we already cyborgs? So, you, on a Monday morning, madly, well, in the olden days, making photocopies. Well, to what extent, I mean, the photocopier is in a way an extension of you. So um, this idea of technology, um, the fact is uh, maybe we're already cyborgs and we just haven't realized it. Going, uh, taking a little sacred, uh, detour through philosophy. So according to the philosopher and media theorist, Marshall McLuhan, um, many of you may not have heard of him. He was so famous in his time that he had a cameo role in Annie Hall in uh, Woody Allen's film, uh, probably greatest film ever. He was that famous for many years, and I think with good reason. And if you want something that's not directly EFL rated, but it's incredibly stimulating, there are several of his lectures on YouTube that in my view are mind blowing and we should all be watching them to think about how we're using technology. So according to him, um, uh, the media are an extension of the human central nervous system. In his book, The Gutenberg Galaxy in 1962, he wrote the following, this externalization of our senses creates what De Chardin calls the noosphere or a technological brain for the world. Instead of tending towards a vast Alexandrian library, the world has become a computer, an electronic brain, exactly as an infantile piece of science fiction. And as our senses have gone outside us, Big Brother goes inside. So unless aware of this dynamic, we shall at once move into a phase of panic terrors exactly befitting a small world of tribal drums, total interdependence, and superimposed coexistence. Maybe this final bit, the more dark political aspect, can go at the quick Q&A at the end. Um, so, going back to the essential elements of a cyborg, so we've got enhanced abilities, integrated technology, and feedback. I want you now, you've got a couple of prompts. How important are the following to your identity as a teacher? Okay, so we see your face and your gaze. Yes, obviously, most people are saying that it's really important. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Okay, now, your voice, again, pretty important. The SLA research you've read. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Hmm, somewhat important, okay. Uh, it's a revealing 
configured. Okay. Now, the tech tools you use with your learners. Okay. Again, um, kind of neither here nor there, a bit of a, bit of a mixed bag. Okay. Now, yes, is there someone? Wants to say something? Okay, so my question here, I've got, we're gonna be going into breakout rooms and before we do so, I've just got a couple of questions. Um, basically my question, uh, my first question is, do we still have a print media mindset? And this is what uh, Marshall McLuhan got me thinking about. This idea that um, when a new medium emerges, it, initially it ends up being used in the ways that the uh, previous medium was used. Um, so my question is, when we teach online or, um, or in a blended context, are we re reproducing old patterns? And to what extent do they fit the new reality? Secondly, are we taking advantage of the potential of online media for learning? And are interaction patterns top of mind when using tech? So I guess this is the idea of uh, putting pedagogy before technology. So now, um, I'm going to put you into breakout rooms and um, before we go into the breakout rooms, I want you to scan the QR code or use this uh, shortened URL, um, which will take you to a Google Doc for you to, uh, you've got the questions uh, there to discuss and you can take some notes in your breakout rooms. So take a moment now and I will also share this address using the chat box. Or uh, Jessica, can you put, um, do you want to put the um, participants in the breakout rooms? Okay. Cool. Very nice. Oh, going back. Okay, and, we, and we're back. And we're back. The Brady Bunch is back. Okay. Okay. Okay, so. <laughs> Again, this is one of those things where I've got you re recording things in text, but because we've got so many breakout rooms, I'm not going to get too distracted by going. I actually did pop in. So I'm just going to mention a couple of things that you guys can jump in. Um, uh, so Ailey, I thought mentioned something. Um, in, is Ailey, is that how you pronounce it, I hope? Um, a waste of content. So saying not take that actually the internet, that using online resources, there's actually a lot um, that we can take better advantage of. Um, uh, Kiva, uh, not, again, my, my apologies if I'm mispronouncing that, um, saying that a lot of time is uh, wasted on or spent, it's necessary, spent on uh, dealing with technical issues. For example, I've realized I need to teach in my students, I've been doing this, this this morning, telling everyone, when you're in a breakout room, the minute I, when you see the option to re reconvene, click on return to main session. Otherwise, if you're doing a communicative <laughs> lesson with lots of uh, breakout rooms, you can spend 10 minutes of a lesson just waiting for people to come back. Um, lots of things. So um, Tom talking about uh, uh, maybe the PPP dynamic with course books not working so well online. So um, now let's return to any comments, anything that's any burning. Yes. We were talking about Sorry, is that okay if I say? We were talking about how, how much clearer you have to give your instructions to students mm -hmm. online, because especially if it's not a synchronous session, um, it's, you know, if you give slightly vague instructions, students will go off in a completely different direction. And so they need to be much clearer. And you need to think of all the things that might go wrong. You need to be, have training in insurance basically you have to think of all the risks and try and, and anticipate all of the things people might get wrong i mean exactly yeah we'll we'll get we'll get to how we can deal with this um uh, in uh, a bit later on uh, but that's uh, okay so my experience again i don't want to suggest that i've um come up with some magical formula of course i haven't it's just um we'll take tidbits from each other and uh so um, one thing I started doing actually well before lockdown is I, 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 I'm, a, I, I'm really keen on dogma. I think the name is unfortunate, but I think the concept is strong. Uh, so um, even before we, I was online, I was really keen on recording emergent language. So uh, having a Google Doc that you share with its learners, a single document from the get-go, um, in which you record all that emergent language that comes up in class that's so valuable. Um, and so 
here's just a, a very ba bare bones uh, uh, procedure, let's say. You have that initial document which you share with them and reuse. For example, in a Zoom session, I don't use the, the whiteboard uh, tool, I use a, a Google Doc. And the idea is, to, as I said, to use it as a repository for Lexis, error correction, anything that you're doing. So it's your whiteboard. Um, and in a way, it's also your course book, I think. Um, and you also leave time at the end of class because, again, people are talking about teachers. And I think um, Jackie's going to talk about the issue of taking our needs into consideration in the sense of uh, making this, uh, you know, being pedagogically sound in our approach, but also not overwhelming ourselves with a undue uh, workload. So, um, for example, we, just the way we often don't give people enough time to think before, before we jump in, um, we often don't let students consciously say, okay, leave the last 10 minutes of the lesson for them to decide what, was, what they think was worth retaining and that should go into the document. And that takes some of the onus, of the, uh, the burden off of you. As it, as it so it should be. Um, um, and then what I'll do is typically um, prepare some gap fill sentences to review the words, chunks, or structures that were done in the previous lesson at the beginning of the next class. And um, you can, uh, again, if you're feeling ambitious, um, try occasionally using a corpus. If you're trying to write co-text for flashcards, as I'm going to talk about, um, um, Sometimes it's good to double check our instincts um, uh, uh, by looking in, um, in um, a corpus like COCA, the con contemporary American, whatever, sketch engine, etc. Okay. Um, and teaching learners the importance of spaced retrieval using something like Quizlet, um, conducting periodic review sessions. One fantastic thing, um, I know, I think it was, uh, well, one of you was mentioning feeling that things, just feeling overwhelmed and tired. And um, a very simple dynamic is these periodic uh, review sessions, put learners in pairs in breakout rooms and have them test each other using a class set. Just the way I have a class set of notes that gets put into a parallel main set of uh, Quizlet items, which can grow to be a couple of hundred items long over a year. And uh, in a pollination webinar a few months ago, he talked, well, he's, talked about in, in his literature and his publications about devoting a third of your class time to review, which is massive. I thought I did a lot. And it was, I was, it was, I was like, I almost wanted to kiss him when he said this because I thought, oh, I can deal even more and I won't be, be I'll, I won't be an irresponsible teacher. I won't be a lazy teacher. Um, and he talked about how they did, the, a doctoral student has studied the impact of having that, that's uh, putting people together and having them test each other. And the, that sort of positive impact of peer pressure. Um, so, like I said, that's a way of um, uh, the idea of teaching less and reviewing more. If, if our goal is not so much to teach, but to ensure learning. Um, and so, here's an example. These are just some notes. My Google note, my my Google Doc notes are not. They don't start out clean um, at all. It's a mixture of English and Spanish, maybe occasional Catalan word. Um, if I'm feeling ambitious, okay. And then it gets kind of cleaned up for the next session, where I do some gap fills. And then you can bulk import those into Quizlet. Um, and here's an example. Um, let's say you're teaching the, the phrasal verb put forward and you're thinking, well, what would be the best examples? And so here you can use a corpus and, and it kind of, you immediately get you no know, plan, proposal, idea, argument, theory. Um, so here's, like I said, this leads into Quizlet. Um, uh, previous iteration of this talk, I was thinking Quizlet is not just a flashcard uh, application. It is a palace. It is, it is, a, it is, a, it needs more promotion. It is an entire language laboratory in your, in your pocket. And I realized that maybe language laboratories have a bad name because I don't know, audiolingualism, behaviorism, but I don't really get why, what's so bad about behaviorism, but I, I'm clearly not educated enough. Um, I need to be I think um, it can be resuscitated. Um, so basically all these amazing functions that we see massive rooms to accomplish, we can do it with and better with uh, uh, a student's mobile phone. So um, these flashcards, you can integrate images, diagrams, and GIFs even. Um, and it's just with young learners, it'd be some amazing stuff with movement. Uh, uh, Stock Thornbury's 
uh, text about uh, mir uh, mirror cells in the brain and how um, uh, using movements, so getting students to record themselves. We could have animations and flashcards for young learners. That would be really fun. Um, the text can be read aloud with an artificial voice or your own, so you can work on intonation. And even the artificial voice now has um, um, connected features of connected speech. You can enhance the cards typographically. You can generate quizzes. You can monitor their learning. Um, and you can also have uh, Quizlet Live, which is now available online, so you can have them compete against each other, which is sort of like Kahoot but better in my view. Um, it can also be used to uh, work on grammar. It's not just vocabulary. Um, you can turn grammar exercises into flashcards and so you're uh, allowing multiple encounters and encouraging automaticity. And um, here, each of the light colored cards needs to is one side of the dark colored cards, the gray. So is to show you some different grammatical structures. Um, any, any, can anyone volunteer a grammatical structure that might be re related to one of these pairs? Anyone? Okay, so that inversion, for example, I'd never felt so afraid before, never had before had I felt so afraid, and, and I think you get the idea. Um, now, using corpora, um, because those of you, as, I, um, as Jess mentioned, people are concerned about assessment. How do I test? If, if, if saying, I have to learn new technology and you want me to go dogma, like, like, um, so what if you want is predetermined, what if you want is some sort of, uh, at least partially predetermined syllabus? Um, so there are lots of um, um, corpus derived lists of high frequency vocabulary, which we can turn into Quizlet sets. Um, there's the um, list of the 150 most frequently used phrasal verbs in English, um, and even breaks, breaks, breakdowns of the, the percentages of the different uses of those phrasal verbs. Um, the co-text that they did is not very good, I must say, in my view. So there's, but that's a project uh, I, uh, that's uh, on the back burner. Uh, the idea is you, you would have to write good co-text for it, but the, we know what the 150 most common phrasal verbs are. Um, we've got the, uh, similarly, we've got the multi-word units, like at all, or any, any kinds of multi chunks that are not transparent that uh, we, if we want to teach them systematically, we've got that list as well. I think it's 500 items. Um, we've got another gem, which is the Cambridge English profile. Um, I love this. It's um, a corpus containing discrete grammar and vocabulary items. It's searchable by CEFR level. It's based on actual learner output, sort of a, a, a can-do um, uh, approach. So, uh, and many of the grammar items have a lexical flavor to them and they also open you up to, you know, there's this uh, um, danger of us often teaching grammar items because they're teachable, not because they're useful. Um, and this, 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 this corpus kind of brings to light uh, real, the real way we use grammar that we, we kind of lose sight of when we're just used to the typical grammar items that we see in a course book. Um, and a brilliant talk that illustrates this in very simplistic, very, not simplistically, but simply, is uh, Dr. Uh, O'Keefe uh, of the University of Limerick, her looking at learner grammar competency rather than error, what makes an advanced learner. And I, I know this is a bit off on a tangent, but I just want to point this, out, point this out because this shows you how corpora do not just teach us arcane things that might be useful for the few of us who might be teaching advanced or proficiency. For example, she points out that one of the key uh, differences between an advanced learner and a lower level learner is their use of adverbs. And uh, I realized that uh, if you look at uh, our book, we do not deal with adverbs at a high, uh, and because I, I often wonder, I'm sure many of you wonder, why our advanced learners somehow maybe just don't produce writing that feels natural. And then you see there's this incredibly simple uh, realization, thanks to corp uh, corpus analysis, that um, the there's, and there's a whole, there's lots of work to be done in terms of it's not just use of adverbs, it's the types of adverbs, the placement in the sentence, you know, is it a sentence head adverb? Does it occur in the middle of the sentence? 
tons of work that could be done with this. Um, now, Flipgrid. Um, I think I'm going to, well, I'll do, I'll do my best to cover this. I know I'm covering a lot of things that maybe seem tangentially related. I'm trying to shoehorn a lot of different things together. And well, um, it's, it is what it is. So um, uh, this is connected to Jackie's point about, and uh, I think it was uh, uh, Kiva's ish point about technical. A, a lot of our teaching is taken up with technical uh, issues. And uh, so we're talking about how you Flipgrid is a video platform, not just for sharing speaking tasks, but also for sharing um, tutorials. Because I think that's a huge area to be exploited. So um, this uh, uh, Flipgrid is uh, a Microsoft product and you can share short videos. You decide how long they are. So you can, um, they can be between 90 seconds and 10 minutes. Members, as students, they watch each other's videos and then give feedback using either video or rubrics. So I upload a video and then Jessica can upload a video in response, or she can just tick a rubric, a default one, or you can easily set up uh, uh, your own rubric. Uh, you set a speaking prompt and the prompts can be a combination of text, a video, or links to resources. Um, they can be carried out, or usually the idea is this is good for asynchronous tasks, asynchronous speaking tasks. There's a performative aspect. I like to keep the, the to, to short the videos, so they actually have to rehearse, rehearse short clips. So they might spend an hour producing a three minute video, but you're not watching an hour of video, which is just not feasible, but you're scaffolding it. Um, um, it's great because this, again, going back to the idea of the medium, video just provides so much more. Uh, uh, um, why, why this emphasis on essays when um, you can kind of get them to do a spoke, it's kind of like a spoken essay. So you're giving them a more, more feedback because you can give feedback on their pronunciation and you're delivering the feedback with your voice and your image. Um, you can stipulate target language if you want to address avoidance. Um, and you're also, uh, if you're setting a topic where they're all, all the students are what, uh, responding to videos on the same issue, if you're stipulating language, then they're going to be getting the, uh, the benefit of the, the narrow reading or narrow viewing in this case, because they're all going to be using sim uh, uh, similar or, or the same uh, items. This is based on a, um, uh, a blog post on my website. So I'm just going to go through this very quickly. And if you want more information, you can go to my website and I've got several items, several posts about, about this. So this is an example of how Flipgrid works. So you've got your speaking prompt, which I've highlighted in pink. Um, in the instructions, you stipulate exactly how many so as Jack was saying, you know, we've got to be crystal clear. Okay. Uh, reply to at least two responses. Okay. Um, so the expectations are, expectations are very clear. And then um, uh, stipulate target language. If you want, you can be, I mean, I'm not, this is not the only way to go about it. Um, and you attach resources. So this is also the idea of how, how tools can interact. So we've got Quizlet, we've got all these different, uh, we've got Google Docs can be uh, used synergistically with Quizlet and Quizlet can be then fed into uh, a speaking task on Flipgrid. We got a Google Slides and then uh, a link to a Guardian article. Okay. Here's another example taken from a YouTube video and worksheets from uh, the Speak Out series. So they basically write a text and then the idea is that they rehearse it and I've actually I included an extension which, which reads the text out to them in following features of natural speech and they rehearse it and then record it. So this is not, this is not exactly, uh, this is uh, a very particular type of speaking task um, which may not be suitable for your learners. Um, so this is one way of how we can use course book materials to uh, these materials to quickly set up a well scaffolded task. Um, and, um, like I said, it's a kind of a, com a combination. They, they, they script their answer, they rehearse the, 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 the pronunciation, and then they perform it, uh, on before the camera. Now, this, I think actually is really the exciting bit. Um, uh, video 
for tutorials. Um, uh, on the desktop version of Flipgrid, you can record your screen instead of using your camera. And it means that it's a, a platform that allows you to easily record interactive tutorials on how to use technology in the classroom. And what's great about this is that um, your learners can respond with a video and they can in turn share their own, say, I'm not, I can't do this. This is not working. And they can share their screen. And um, it, so it's, 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 it's uh, perhaps you might get to the bottom of the problem faster than if you're, you've got a, a, a bunch of emails. You say, oh, I see you're using whatever software. So um, I'll quickly show you an example. So let's see how to make a very quick tutorial in Flipgrid by recording your screen. So here's the topic creation screen. I've given it a title and there's a prompt. You can even have uh, automatically generated closed captions, good for lower level learners. And now I'm going to choose the option record a video. Instead of using my camera, I'm going to choose the option down here, record screen. Okay. Now, what I record from now on will be captured in Flipgrid. So I choose your entire screen. Okay. And as of now, this is recording. Okay. So let's see. I want to explain to my learners how to go about using Quizlet on a desktop. So let's say I want to, here's a set of uh, vocabulary. Now, one problem is that learners, when they start using uh, Quizlet, sometimes they see this main screen and they think this is where they study the flashcards and then they get confused. Lots of little uh, uh, snags like this can cause problems. So now I'm going to explain the tutorial. Click on flashcards. Okay. And now you can explain different uh, aspects of the activity. Uh, I might want to point out sometimes the definition and the term appear in the wrong order. So you might want to point out that there's these options at the, uh, at the bottom and you can change which side of the card you see first. And that you can turn on the audio function so that you can hear the text uh, read out loud. And it's done with an automatic uh, voice generating software, which is actually quite good and even has aspects of, uh, uh, what do you call it, connected speech. Yes. So these are like lots of little details, lots of little features that you want all of your learners to be aware of for them to get maximum benefit uh, from this. So by creating this little tutorial that you've scripted ahead of time, which I haven't done today, but uh, you're being generous with me, um, you will make sure to cover all of your bases. And that way you don't have to repeat yourself a hundred times. You can just refer your students to this tutorial that's been put on Flipgrid. There you go. Okay, now, okay, we're running a tiny bit short on time, but I do think this is, uh, well, so what I'm gonna do, instead of putting you in breakout rooms, we're gonna do this just uh, as a group. I want you to uh, think about something very specific, it could be, um, an aspect of it could be how to write a paragraph, but I'll not necess I want you to think about a skill. This is going back to what Jackie was saying. Think of something, it could be very something very banal, uh, but um, hold on, where are we? Okay. Um, I want you to think of a, a task or skill that lends itself to a tutorial. It can be something very small, like I said, just um, question, like for example, teaching them within uh, Zoom to always click on return to main session the minute they see that button so that we're not wasting our bloody time. Um, think of something that seems, seems unimportant, but over time accumulates. So uh, uh, um, Jessica, do you think we have time to do a short breakout room or? Um... I don't mind if everybody else is doing Okay, we'll do it very short, a couple of minutes. maybe two or three minutes. So I'm gonna put you into breakout rooms. Just think of something that would benefit from a very methodical tutorial. And stop share and breakout rooms. There you go.
video and I got it all wrong because of the software I had been using didn't work. But, and eventually I create a little document, but something like, I think something like that would work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think they have to be short, you know, one or two minutes is sort of enough. Yeah, just um, little pointers, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so more things. Um, how to... Moodle, I don't know. The Moodle platform, it would be interesting for them to to know uh, which kind of attacks uh, they can do, uh, the, the different type of, uh, of uh, tools that uh, the platform uh, 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 provides feature to prepare material. Yeah. So this would be interesting because last yesterday I was teaching my students in a different degree and they, they have never used uh, um, a tool that is a question forum, a question and answer forum. So, Right, exactly. I mean, anything. I like your first idea best. We're going to tell you, we're going to share that one. Sean, we, we want to make a, a, a video in Flipgrid for how students can use Flipgrid for, for, for the task that she's got for next week. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And then you think specifically what you want them to do. I think that the, tr the trick here is that no tutorial can tell you everything. So you've got to think specifically, what, what was it or what is it you particularly want to do? You, you want your students to do on Monday and then mm -hmm. show them how to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and somebody will find that video useful. Most people will find that video useful. Okay, so um, maybe we can just do this. Uh, if you want to turn off, uh, uh, um, unmute yourself. Any any ideas? We we actually talked about sharing materials. A lot of my students are over sixty, for example, mm -hmm. and they're finding using technology quite a, a, a challenge. Um, and so having some kind of mini tutorial on how to take a screenshot or how to take a photo, that, that would be useful for them. Yeah, actually that's interesting. I think Flipgrid, um, it, it's, it's also, it's, it's app-based, which makes you think it's for young people, <laughs> which is a stupid thing to say. But it's very, everything, it's very well designed, even though it's, I don't like Microsoft in general, in, but this is a very well designed product. And actually for older learners, I think it's good because, um, um, yeah, that's a very good, interesting for older learners. Yeah. Uh, other ideas? Uh, maybe Carmen just one. Had, yeah. Carmen had an idea. Carmen had an idea. Go Carmen. Carmen. Okay. Well, uh, my, the thing is that today I have a lesson. That's why I <laughs> entered the, the, you know, the, the course later. And uh, it was with a student of engineering, computing engineering. And we are working about, uh, about uh, uh, how to explain it, uh, an activity, an oral activity, where I want uh, them to explain uh, uh, what is a, a, a computer. So my, my intention is that they record themselves explaining what is a computer using Flipgrid. I have already uh, designed the activity, but uh, today I asked them if they knew how to use Flipgrid, and they told me that they have never used it. So I think that it might be interesting to prepare a, a, a tutorial about how to use Flipgrid to, in order to do the activity. Because yeah. there are some students that normally don't attend the lessons, you know. Yeah. And for young learners, they'll love it because you can make it visually appealing and have, there's all kinds of cinematic effects. And also if you want to put, you make things uh, salient, you can put, the, easily put a text box with the key expressions or things that you're, it's, it's, and they'll love it. Like my students, they, they put emojis and, and they make it pretty and, and, and yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Um, so I know that I've gone slightly over, so I'll just let me con conclude um, so that Jackie can have the stage. Um, so um, basically to try to unify this, uh, so I think one important thing is thinking about how tools interact and kind of uh, work synergistically, that, that together they, they have a greater impact than individually. Um, 
that we can extend our reach. This idea of a benevolent cyborg, that if we, like, if we make tutorials which have been scripted ahead of time, um, this is, I've actually, there's some um, amazing things about what the Khan Academy, MOOCs, and I think it, we don't realize, like imagine all the things that we've explained over, a, like maybe if you've only, you're in the EFL for a year, this isn't worth your while, but we're not, that, we're not in that situation. Oh, year after year, we explain the same things. Imagine if you took a couple of hours and explained it like as if it was your, um, an ex, your, um, uh, your being, it's, it's your doctoral dissertation defense or it's your Delta observed lesson. Imagine if you put that effort in every time and then could recycle that. It was like you at your best. And I really do think it's possible. Um, so, um, I think we need to find a way to make this exciting for ourselves uh, rather than an, an additional like a have to. Um, and also and, and enjoying creating things that are visually engaging. Um, so, um, and there's also this final concept about uh, the idea of uh, another portmanteau, uh, the prosumer. So the, this is back in the 70s, they came up with this idea, the blurring of the roles of consumers and producers has its origins in the cooperative self. Marshall McLuhan and Barrington Nevitt suggested in a 1972 book, Take Today, that with electronic technology, the consumer would become a producer. And then in the 1980 book, The Third Wave, futurologist Alvin Toffler coined the term prosumer, which sounds awful, but uh, when he predicted that the role of producers and consumers would begin to blur and merge, he envisioned a highly saturated marketplace as mass production of standardized products began to satisfy basic consumer demands. To continue growing profit, businesses would initiate a process of mass customization. That is the mass production of highly customized products. And this customized, there's a mass produced product, I think in this, our case is the course book. Um, and I don't want to sound like too much of a Pollyanna, but um, I think uh, we should all be thinking about making this transition from consumer to producer. Not because we have to, because it's an, a meaningful process. So thank you for uh, your participation. That's my website. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Sean Hatchman. So. So back thank to you very much, Sean. I'm going to stop the recording now briefly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, because we've gone. Um